Near Innsbruck stands a monument to perversity. Castle Ambras, occupied during the 16th century by Archduke Ferdinand, harbors one of the most terrifying portrait galleries in the civilized world. Painted from life, these grotesqueries reflect the offbeat tastes of the collector. In this gallery of the bizarre are images of those maimed in battle or deformed by nature. One portrait seems curiously out of place. It's that of a king who ruled not in Austria, but in a land to the east, now called Romania. His brutality earned him the nickname Vlad the Impaler. His real name was Vlad Dracula. Centuries later, Dracula's name and the land he lived in would be used to create a character so unredeemed by human qualities that we still recoil in fascination at his fiendish exploits. or reality, a search for the truth behind the legend. This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. Horror has a special fascination for many, and filmmakers have done their best to exploit that fascination. Audiences have come to know Dracula well. They've seen him portrayed on the screen for more than 50 years. There's the black cape, the jutting canine teeth, the demonic eyes and nocturnal lust for blood. But what of the truth behind the legend? Romania is a land rich in romantic folklore and legends. The tale of the evil Count Dracula is not one of them. The rugged mountains and hidden valleys breed their own mythology. Called Romania's Olympus, Mount Ceflau rises nearly 6,000 feet in the Carpathian Mountains. In pre-Christian times, it was believed to be the home of the gods. Each year, even now, on the first Sunday of August, a pagan ritual is reenacted. Thousands gather by torchlight on Cheflau's shadowy summit to celebrate friendship and love and the renewal of life. During the rest of the year, Cheflau yields its mysteries to few men. Dr. George Yakumi is a surgeon who climbs mainly for adventure. The other, a shepherd, who has spent a lifetime in these alpine meadows. Both know the mountain and its hidden places. Both respect its awesome symbolic power. Though one is a simple peasant, the other a man of science, the mountain has given them a strong bond of friendship. They exchange stories of ancient superstitions of dark, frightening corners where no one has yet ventured. The music seems to recall a distant time in these mountains when ghosts inhabited Cheflau. Legends tell of a 15th century nobleman named Boudou who loved the king's daughter, Anna. When he was killed in battle, 
the grief-stricken Anna asked the powerful witch to bring her lover back from the dead. The witch raised Voodoo from his grave, but as a ghost. While passing over Cheflau, Voodoo's ghost was struck by the rising sun, turning him into rock. Till this day, on Cheflau's brooding summit, there is a stone megalith known as Voodoo's Tower. In the nightmare world of superstition and fear, it often becomes difficult to separate fact from fiction. The familiar story of Dracula is a case in point. Since its publication in 1897, Bram Stoker's classic novel of gothic horror has been read or performed almost continuously. Yet few are aware that the character was based on a real prince of darkness, whose deeds are perhaps more shocking and more terrifying than those of the fictional vampire. Transylvania, stronghold of legend. A place dimly recalled from horror movies as a dark, forbidding region cloaked in superstition and terror. Here, according to popular myth, live the undead, the dreaded vampires who thrive on human blood. Dracula, written by Bram Stoker, perpetuated one myth that has endured for nearly a century. Along Transylvania's southern perimeter stands Castle Braun. In appearance, it corresponds to the castle described in the novel as the home of the bloodthirsty Count. Haunted by his own childhood visions of threatening forests and spooky castles, Bram Stoker created an eerie world that became more than just a horrifying journey into the supernatural. It was also a parable of Victorian repression. Locked inside Castle Dracula's dark walls were hidden passions and secret longings which erupted into violence and terror. German film classic Nosferatu comes closer to capturing the mood of the original novel than the later interpretation of Bela Lugosi. In the book, the hero Jonathan Harker describes his first encounter with Dracula. Holding out his hand, he grasped mine with a strength which made me wince, an effect which was not lessened by the fact that it seemed as cold as ice. Taking Transylvania, a remote place he'd heard of but never seen, as his setting, Stoker evoked chilling images of the living dead. Under the shroud of darkness, the fiendish apparition risen from its coffin begins to stalk its human prey. nightmare becomes reality. The unknown clutches at our throats. The shrieking of the vampire bat evokes the horror of Dracula. Night flying hunters, they prey mainly on cattle. But one strange fact stands out. The vampire bat is found only in Mexico and South America. Modern Romanians stubbornly deny the existence of vampire legends in Transylvanian peasant lore. To them, Dracula is the name of a 15th century tyrant whose story too was written in blood. Nikolai Paduraru is an official of the Ministry of Tourism. His search for the historical truths behind the Dracula legends brings him repeatedly to a small island on Lake Snagov, near the capital city of Bucharest. It is on this island 
that the body of the real Dracula is supposedly buried. Nikolai knows the island's history and its few inhabitants intimately. A product of Romania's socialist present, he is fascinated by his nation's turbulent past. Nikolai is greeted by the abbot who shares his interest in the story of the bloody king who bore the name Dracula. For the two men, the old church has become more than a religious shrine and national monument. Its ancient doors are the gateway to a mystery that for centuries has baffled scholars and historians. Superstitious romantics have speculated that any robber entering the church would be met by Dracula's ghost, rising in vengeance from its grave. And this, they say, is why he lies buried just inside the door. A more logical explanation was forwarded by archaeologist Dino Rossetti, who uncovered the burial site in the early 30s. The decapitated body was placed in an unmarked grave to prevent vandalism. Saints and kings have begun to fade silently from Snagov's walls. The monastery enjoyed the protection of Vlad Dracula during the 15th century. But when one of the priests dared challenge the king's decisions, he was put to death, slowly and painfully. The torturous method of execution favored by the king was so barbarous, his own countrymen branded him Vlad the Impaler. In Romanian, Vlad Sepes. Both men realize that the truth about a man's life is often buried alongside his corpse. That the infamous monarch whose name symbolizes evil incarnate might himself have been the victim of propaganda spread by his enemies throughout Europe. Seeking the truth can become an exciting adventure, and so a search begins. It will unravel some of the mysteries which surround the life of a king they called Dracula, son of the devil. Transylvania, the heart of Dracula country. Transylvania spreads across northwestern Romania in an unbroken chain of fertile hills and sunlit valleys. Here, the princes of Wallachia sought refuge from fierce Muslim warriors who burned their villages, raped their land, and punished captives by mercilessly driving stakes through their bodies. From the Turks, a young Wallachian prince named Dracula would learn all about impalement. Like an image from an old fairy tale, the town of Sigishora slumbers peacefully along the gentle slopes of the Transylvanian highlands. Unchanged since the Middle Ages, Sigishora was once a bastion of Germanic military might and commercial enterprise. In this house, in 1431, a son was born to the fearsome prince Vlad Dracul, the dragon. The boy was called Dracula, son of the dragon. A coin bearing the family emblem is one of the few remaining artifacts from Dracula's reign. The symbol of the dragon reinforced Vlad's image as a fearless Christian crusader. As his notoriety grew, the name Dracula took on new meaning. Dragon would be increasingly interpreted as devil. Vlad belonged to an age of brutality. The Renaissance, which saw the rebirth of art and learning, also bred new tyrannies, unspeakable torture and oppression. To understand Vlad's cruelty, 
we must also understand his world. The nunnery at Suchevitsa was originally a fortified monastery, protected by walls 20 feet high and 10 feet thick. The traditional woodblock, summoning nuns and monks to prayer, may at one time have also been a summons to battle. For the monasteries of Romania were more than strongholds of the Christian faith. They were part of a formidable defense perimeter to ward off invaders. It's likely that the young Dracula looked out from the battlements of such a monastery, watching men die in the brutal spectacle of war. Steeped in the teachings of the Eastern Orthodox Church, Vlad Dracula surely must have developed strong, simple notions of good and evil, of reward and retribution. The ladder of virtues, the work of an unknown artist, shows that in the climb toward heaven, few are virtuous enough to reach it. Most topple along the way, headed toward eternal damnation. To a young prince, impressionable, and bristling for power, such messages were clear. By punishing evil, salvation could be had. Until the 16th century, Suceva was the capital of the province of Moldavia. Here, Vlad Dracula fled, deposed after briefly assuming the throne of Wallachia at the age of 17. This was the beginning of his second exile, the first time, he'd been sent as a hostage to the Turkish court by his father, a guarantee against war with the Sultan. As Vlad waited in Suceva to take power, he vowed to free Wallachia from Turkish domination and break the power of the nobles and church. In 1456, the second reign of Vlad Dracula began. The greatest threat to his power centered in the German towns of southern Transylvania. Of these, Brasov was the largest. Convinced that her powerful merchants were conspiring with his enemies, furious at the defiance of his trade restrictions, Vlad launched a series of punitive raids against Brasov and neighboring towns, taking a terrible toll of their citizens. How many perished by his command, no one can say. That slow, torturous death by impalement was excessively barbaric, no one can deny. Yet since the only written accounts from that time come from Germany, it's conceivable the atrocity reports were exaggerated. Not so the massacre at Tirgovisti, Vlad's capital. During his successful campaign against the Turks, he impaled thousands of enemy soldiers outside the city gates to frighten the invaders. He would be known now for all time as Vlad the Impaler. Viewed through the filter of time, another side to Vlad's character emerges. His bold strategies won the admiration of his Turkish opponents, who also regarded him as just and honest. On the threshold of victory, he was betrayed by his younger brother, Radu, and forced into political captivity in Hungary. After 12 years, Vlad was restored to the throne by his cousin, Stephen the Great. Faces from the present. A few among the million and a half who live in Bucharest, Romania's bustling capital. In their city, Vlad the Impaler made his last stand. Not far from the center of Bucharest, with its huge outdoor markets, are archaeological remnants of its past. Layers of history, stripped away, reveal fortifications dating back to the 13th century. Below ground level, there has been unearthed a portion of the original castle built by Vlad Dracula. It was in these haunted surroundings that Dracula planned his last campaign against the Turks. His third and final reign would last only two months. On December 14, 1476, he was killed in battle near Bucharest. 
and according to eyewitnesses, beheaded, perhaps mistakenly, by one of his own troops. Lod's remains were secretly buried at Snagov. In death's darkness, the prince may finally have found peace. If some light has been shed on the truth during this search for Dracula, it doesn't mean that belief in vampires will be dispelled. Bram Stoker's Dracula will always persist in our minds because in him we have found the perfect symbol for unrepentant evil. In Nosferatu, Dracula is destroyed by the daylight, dissolving in a puff of smoke. But many would prefer to feel he can still be found, lurking somewhere in the mist-shrouded mountains of Transylvania. Beneath storybook towers, the old Transylvanian city of Sigishora seems untouched by time. Her people still bear traces of their medieval ancestry, clinging tenaciously to old traditions and religious faith. They are steeped in Sigishora's history, remembering that it once was a stronghold of wealth and power, the home of princes, the birthplace of a king. Vlad Dracula belongs to their heritage, Stoker's vampire to our imaginations. Legends die slowly. The myth of the human being who takes the form of a bat and drinks blood will survive because people choose to believe. Vampires, like werewolves and monsters, serve a purpose. They are representations of our hidden fears. By conquering these nightmare creatures, we purge ourselves of our darkest thoughts and in so doing, reclaim the human spirit.